Okay, good evening. It's nutrition time again, and this is chapter 15, enteral and parenteral nutrition. Let me share my screen and let's get to it. All right, let's start at the beginning. So what are the learning objectives? All right, we're gonna identify patients who can benefit from enteral nutrition and talk about the different routes of feeding and the formulas and the administration considerations for tube feedings. Talk about patients who benefit from parenteral nutrition, same thing. Um, give examples of uh, individuals who need nutritional support uh, with enteral or parenteral nutrition and discuss the metabolic effects of inborn errors of metabolism, in other words, diseases that um, people were born with like phenylketonuria and galactosemia. Okay, so what is an overview of enteral or parenteral nutrition? So enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition is giving nutrients, all the nutrients a person needs either through a feeding tube, that's enteral, or through an IV, that's parenteral. And why? Well, patient could be too sick to eat a regular diet. They may need to give the digestive tract a break. So some examples of that would be maybe they have gastric cancer, right? Um, lots of different reasons, Crohn's disease, uh, severe ulcerative colitis, where you know we have to give the GI tract a break and we give them nutrition through an IV. And so enteral nutrition is using the GI tract and that would include things like G tubes, J tubes, NG tubes. An NG tube is a nasogastric tube that goes up the nose and down the esophagus into the stomach. A G tube, also called a PEG tube, is a gastrostomy tube, and that goes directly into the stomach. And a J tube is a jejunostomy tube, and that goes directly into the jejunum, which is this, the proximal part of the small intestine. And then parenteral nutrition, um, which is something we call TPN, total parenteral nutrition, that's IV nutrients. So we're completely bypassing the digestive tract. And so we've got a little chart here, which gives us a little guidance, like how do we figure out how we feed this patient? You know, so, you know, what do they need and what's going on with them to help us determine, do we give it to them IV or do we use a tube? Um, so supplements, there are lots of oral supplements that we give to patients um, who are too weak or debilitated to eat food, things like protein shakes. They're commonly used a lot, especially in nursing homes for people with wounds. Um, older folks typically don't have much of an appetite. They're not doing much to develop an appetite. So they sometimes don't get enough nutrients and protein shakes are a great way to supplement them. Um, and plus they don't taste bad. So it, it motivates people to drink them. Who are candidates for tube feeding? So who would need a tube feeding? Severe swallowing disorder. So let's say the patient had a really bad stroke, cerebrovascular accident. They may develop something called dysphagia, which is an insufficiency of the epiglottis. So in other words, when they swallow, the epiglottis doesn't close completely, which means that anything that they're swallowing could go into the lung instead of the esophagus. And that puts you at a risk for aspiration pneumonia. So for somebody like that, we might put a G-tube or PEG tube in, right? Um, impaired motility or an obstruction in the digestive tract would be another possible reason. Um, after surgery, certain intestinal surgeries, it's very, very unusual. It says here little or no appetite for an extended period. It is almost contraindicated to do insertion of a, of a PEG tube or a G tube just because someone's appetite is decreased. It really would have to be extreme. Um, people that are on mechanical ventilation. Obviously, they're not able to eat or drink, so they would be candidates for G-tubes um, and somebody who's, you know, in a coma or something like that. Oops. Enteral nutrition. So the roots and this I already talked about this. So I, I beat the PowerPoint. I already told you about nasogastric. There's also nasoduodenal and nasojejunal. They're not common. So in other words, nasogastric tube goes up the nose into the stomach. If I go further into the jejunum or the duodenum, which I can do, not as common, but that's what they're called. Um, for infants, it's called an orogastric. So it's the same principle, but we go through the mouth 
because of their little itty bitty nose where it's hard to get through. Uh, gastrostomy tube, which is a G tube, jejunostomy tube, which is a J tube. And then we've got some pictures here on this slide that show you. And you know, the woman on the left has a nasogastric tube that goes down to the stomach or the duodenum or the jejunum. And then the next one is a gastrostomy tube or jejunostomy tube and shows you where the tubes would be placed. And let's see. Feeding tubes, it goes into some detail about the actual tubes themselves. They're soft, they're flexible tubes, there's different lengths. They're measured in French. So, you know, one, one French unit is one third of a millimeter. And if you know how small a millimeter is, one third of a millimeter is one French. So just to give you an example, um, like Foley catheters, urinary catheters, the smallest size for adults is a 14 French. There's 14, 16, 18, 20, 21, 22 is a garden hose. Not really, but that's what we call it. Um, so for nasogastric tubes, they can go for infants as small as like one French or two French. They're teeny, teeny, skinny little tubes, right? Um, and we choose the size of the tube based on the patient and what we're using it for, obviously. And now we're talking about formula. So there are different kinds of enteral formulas that are used. Standard formulas, which are called polymeric formulas. I'm not going to get into the different types of formulas as far as, you know, what's in them. You don't really need to know that. Um, dietitians, registered dietitians in conjunction with pharmacists, believe it or not, will come up with whatever the recommendation is for that particular patient based on what's wrong. Um, and for TPN, which is the parenteral, the IV nutrition, that's coming from a compound pharmacy because you'll have a bag with all the nutrients, you'll have a bag of lipids, and then you'll have essential elements and micronutrients and vitamins that all get mixed together and administered intravenously. Uh, let's see here. With tube feedings, the feedings can either be intermittent, continuous, or bolus. When you think about a bolus, a bolus means like a shot, boom, one big, sh boom. Uh, continuous would be basal. That's another word for that. Basal is like slow and steady, just constantly getting a slow flow of a feeding. Um, patient with a tube feeding always should be up at at least a 30 degree angle in the bed, preferably a high fowlers, it's called like a 45 degree or 90 degree angle, right? So they should never be lying flat because they can actually aspirate even with a tube feeding, right? Um, G tubes and J tubes get flushed with plain old tap water, right? Because we're going into the stomach or the, you know, the digestive tract. And nasogastric tube is only flushed with normal saline. And there are specialized pumps that we use for G tubes and J tubes, and they're called kangaroo pumps. That's the name of them. Um, and we used to hang to gravity. We don't do it anymore because the pump is just so much more specific. We know how much almost to the exact milliliter the patient's getting, you know. Uh, let's see. You would always measure gastric residual volume. So in other words, let's say I'm giving somebody a tube feeding. Before I would start the tube feeding, I would take a syringe and they're big, like 50 cc or 50 milliliter syringes and aspirate, draw back on the tube to see how much content is still in the stomach from the last feeding, because there should be very little. If there's more than 50 milliliters still in the stomach with intermittent feedings, then you don't administer the feeding. You would flush the tube with like 30 mils of water and notify the physician because maybe there's another obstruction or something's going on. They're not, the, it's not moving through the digestive tract, right? It's still in the stomach. Um, how much water? That's the other thing that nurses sometimes forget. Everybody needs water, right? So with tube feedings, 30 to 40 milliliters of water for about every kil kilogram of how much the person weighs is a good rule of thumb, right? Um, if they have a fever or something else going on, sometimes they'll need more water than that, right? But typically just 30 to 40 mils. And most formulas have about 700 to 800, 850 mils of water for every liter of formula. Um, you can also give medications through these tubes. And this, this is a pet peeve of mine. So when you're giving medications through either an NG tube or a G tube, what you're supposed to do is you take the medication one at a time, crush it, 
put it in water, put it in the syringe, put it through the tube, flush it with water. Next med. If I had a nickel every time I saw them dump a whole cup of meds, smash them all and bloop all at once, that is not the way you do it. Right? It's one at a time and a flush in between each one because what can happen, the tube, a couple things can happen that can go wrong. The tube can get gunked up and clogged. Now you don't know what they've got. Did they get all the meds? Did they get some of the meds? Which ones did they get? I don't know. And that's dangerous because you could be talking about cardiac meds or antihypertensives or whatever, right? So that's dangerous in that aspect. Um, and the tube could get clumped up and that's a problem. Um, little fun tip back in the day, we could use ginger ale, and you still can, to unclog a tube sometimes. If the nurse before you did not effectively flush that G-tube, get a little ginger ale because of the fizz, right? And flush the tube with ginger ale and that sometimes could clear it up. Just a fun little fact. Uh, let's see. So, you know, if the person's getting better and we're tapering them off the tube feeding, you know, it's kind of like we wean them off slowly, right? And we slowly, less tube feeding, more oral intake, right? Until they're back on an oral intake. Uh, parental nutrition, that's an extreme. That's the IV nutrition I talked about. And that's, you're usually very, very, very ill if you're on TPN, right? So Crohn's disease is the one that comes to mind. With end stage Crohn's disease, um, the disease is, it's actually an autoimmune disorder and your white blood cells, your own immune system attacks your small intestine. And your small intestine is where all absorption of nutrients takes place. And it's random. When diseases are random, they're hard to manage. A predictable disease is easier to manage, right? Makes sense? because it's predictable. I know what it's going to do next so I can like ward it off. Crohn's is crazy because it'll attack the jejunum and then maybe it'll go back to the, you know, the proximal portion, you know, go to the duodenum. You don't know where it's going to go. And patient winds up with something called short bowel syndrome. So you got about 20 feet of small intestine, right? Give or take, depending on how tall or short you are. And what happens is when the Crohn's attacks certain parts of that small intestine, it dies. So then we have to go in surgically and remove it. So now from 20 feet, now you got 18 feet. From 18 feet, now you've got 12 feet. I had a woman who had one foot of bowel left. That was an extreme, yeah, she was on TPN. 12 year old daughter was taking care of her. That was a sad case, yeah. So she had Crohn's disease, she passed away. Um, so, you know, TPN, that's, that's really for extreme cases, you know. Um, usually they're saying there are two main access sites. That would be incorrect. You don't ever give TPN through a peripheral line. So, you know, when you go to the hospital and they just stick a peripheral IV in you, we don't put TPN through that. We either put a PIC line in, which is a peripherally inserted central catheter. So it's, it goes in here, but it goes all the way up to the superior vena cava, right? To the heart, right? It's a bigger catheter, so it can handle the TPN. Or a central line, like an implanted port, You'll see these with people with cancer sometimes. Like you'll see a little bulge on the chest wall, kind of looks like a pacemaker. It's a port and it's surgically implanted in the chest, again, right to the superior vena cava. And that can handle bigger amounts of more caustic things like chemotherapy and TPN and that kind of stuff. You would never put this through a peripheral line. So shame on that book, shame, shame. That's incorrect info. Uh, let's see. Central venous access, we're talking about that, and where it goes. Oh, there's even a picture here of, of where the lines go. So that's nice. When you, when you get to the PowerPoint, look at slide 25, which shows you know, the different anatomy, the veins anatomically, and where the lines are actually placed, which is very interesting, where a central line would be placed or a pick line. Uh, the formulas are all customized, again, to suit that particular patient. TPN is even more customized. So with TPN, it's, there's a formula that's used, an algorithm that determines what is the basic minimum of nutrients and micronutrients that this patient needs based on their BMI and all that good stuff, right? Um, for Just for basal metabolic rate. So in other words, just to keep them alive because they're not expending any energy. Um, there's always a risk with everything that we do in medicine. So when we talk about complications, um, catheter-related complications, there could be an air embolism, 
blood clotting at the catheter tip. The catheter can clog. The catheter can get dislodged. They can get an infection, go septic, which is like a blood poisoning, get a phlebitis, which is an inflammation or um, irritation of the vein. There can be injury to the tissue um, with a central line, not as common. And then metabolic disorders, you know, if it's not the exact right formula, they can wind up with electrolyte imbalances. And remember, potassium is the queen mother. So if that's off, you could kill your patient. Um, sometimes patients will get feedings at home. Tube feedings, yes. Rarely to see a patient on, on TPN at home, although it does happen, um, but because it's got to be monitored very carefully. But tube feedings, people get those at home all the time. Uh, let's see, planning home nutritional care. So it's talking about different types of tubes, which we kind of already talked about. Um, the tubes are easily hidden too. So if there's something going on, like some type of maybe a mouth cancer, so they have a feeding tube that's temporary, um, you know, they can still go about their business and just do intermittent bolus feedings. And that tube can just be hidden. Like you would never even know that they had it. Uh, let's see. So with nutrition support at home, you know, sometimes there are quality of life issues. And I say this all the time. It's not the number of years that you're on the earth but the quality of the years that you're here, you know? So if your whole life is revolved around medical care, there's not a whole lot of quality of life there, right? If your sleep is disturbed, if you can't have a meal with your family and friends, like those are all things that have to be taken into consideration. Everything in medicine is always what's the risk and what's the benefit. And we weigh them out. And the benefit needs to outweigh the risk. That's everything that we do. Uh, and then we're talking about uh, inborn errors of metabolism. So these are things that people were born with, like genetic mutations, um, you know, and, and this is where we get into the diseases like PKU. PKU is phenylketonuria. So it's a metabolic disorder and it's, it's diagnosed when a baby is born. And what it is, it's, it's an inability of the body to metabolize proteins, specific amino acids that are proteins. Um, there's a missing enzyme that you need in order for your body to convert the enzyme or convert the, um, the amino acids into proteins. Um, they do, every baby gets a PK, PKU test after it's born. That's pretty standard across the board. Um, it's very difficult to treat PKU. It's not common, but it's not extremely rare either. But um, it's all about enteral feedings and very specific amounts of amino acids. So it's, it's, you know, it's a, li it's a lifelong burden. And then galactosemia is a problem with carbohydrate metabolism. So galactose is something that is found in, you know, dairy, some dairy products, right? Some starches too. Um, they don't, again, they're missing an enzyme. They're just born where they don't have that enzyme that metabolizes galactose. And if the galactose builds up in the body, it can actually eat away almost like an acid at your body tissues. So um, brain damage and death can occur from that. Um, they can't have milk, milk products, certain starches. They can't have livers or organ, any organ meats, um, some legumes, fruits, and vegetables. This is more, way more rare than the PKU. I personally, in my career, have never seen a patient with galactosemia. I've seen PKU babies, you know, and that's it for this chapter. How about that? That was pretty easy, enteral feedings. So let me stop my share and stop the recording.